Thank you. Such a pleasure to be here this evening. Such a privilege. And I'm so excited that so many people have signed up to this, this lecture. So let me start by asking, why did you choose to become an engineer? What do you want to achieve in being an engineer? And if you're anything like many of the engineers that James and I speak to, it's probably because you want to make the world better. We think that's why most engineers show up each day, to make the world a little bit better to build buildings, homes, schools, hospitals, grand designs that improve places, that improve parts of the world. Nobel Prize winner for economics, Herbert Simon, said that everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. In other words, design makes things better. And yet, if we stand back, we know that the net effect of our work in the construction industry is actually to make things worse. 42% of carbon emissions in the UK are controlled or influenced by the built environment. 62% of waste and 50% of material use results from the UK construction industry. Those are figures that I heard presented last week by architects declare in Parliament. Our industry has a massive um, negative impact on the world in which we live. Far from making things better, the net effect of our industry is to make things worse. For those who come to work each day to make things better, this is hugely dispiriting. In 2019, soon after the publication of the IPCC's devastating update on the climate crisis, people in our sector started talking about a different approach to design. One that didn't merely damage, uh, one that didn't merely limit damage, but one that actually led to thriving communities and ecosystems. That approach is referred to as being regenerative. It actually appears twice in the Structural Engineers Declare statement that many of your firms may have signed up to. But what is regenerative design? What can it do? Can structural engineers be regenerative? Can you be regenerative? And can it help us make the world better? Back in 2022, I co-founded the Regenerative Design Lab as a place to explore what regenerative design means in practice for our industry. And at about the same time, James and I started having conversations about writing a book for our people, a book for structural engineers about how can they be regenerative? How can we be regenerative as an industry? In this time that we've got with you this evening, we're gonna take you through some of the ways that we frame regenerative design and the role of the regenerative designer. And we'll take you through one of the many case studies that we've got in our book. And then there'll be time for discussion, Q&A at the end. So let's start with one of those models. To help us make sense of what we see going on around us in construction, we made a simple systems model, which we call the systems bookcase. And it's based on the thinking of a leading systems thinker, Danella Meadows. Imagine you've got a bookcase like the bookcase that you might have in a design office. On the bottom shelf, let's say that's where we file all the details of our current and recent projects. We're gonna call this the design shelf at the bottom. Now, of course, we don't just design any old thing. The rules that we have, there are rules that we have to follow, design codes, building regulations, codes of contact, uh, conduct, professional practice, supply chain restrictions, all of these things stipulate or reinforce what we can or can't design. All of those rules and all those reinforcing factors we put on the next shelf up and we call that the operations shelf. So what goes on the bottom shelf, the design shelf, is what is allowed by what's on the operations shelf above. But these rules themselves don't just appear from anywhere. They emerge from a collective mindset about what we hold important. For example, a mindset that values protecting heritage might lead to some local planning laws that say, you can't put solar panels on that roof, which means actually when we come to the actual design, there ain't no solar panels on the roof. So we see a link between mindsets that exist, the operating rules, and then what we're actually able to design. But these mindsets too don't come from nowhere, they're constrained. In fact, they're guided by something higher up, the system's goals, by what we in the system are collectively trying to achieve. For the construction industry, James and I define this really as three things. The clue's in the name, we're a construction industry. One of our goals is to build stuff. Secondly, to do it profitably, and importantly, to do it safely. 
those are the systems goals of the construction industry. That is what our industry is configured to do. But even these goals aren't freely determined. They didn't come from nowhere. They're shaped by something even higher. And that is the paradigm or overarching philosophy of our economy, which in the UK and the rest of the global north is dominated by the idea of continuous economic growth. That is the operating philosophy within which our industry exists. Ultimately, the goals, the mindsets, the operating rules, and finally, what we design are fundamentally aligned towards this philosophy of growth. Of course, some deviations from this philosophy are allowed, but they tend to be small. And the more the project deviates from enabling growth, the more the barriers there will be to it succeeding. So, James and I asked, where does sustainability fit on this bookcase? Sustainability refers to the principle of meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So this sounds like a goal, sounds like a really high level thing that we're trying to achieve. And this is reflected in the concept of the triple bottom line, economic, social and environmental value. But as James describes, the economic one is still the main one. And the other two are a bit like goal difference in football. They're only considered if you've got a tiebreaker on the price, which means Sustainability as a whole isn't working at a very high level in our systems bookcase. It's actually existing lower down. Rather than being a high level goal, it's probably merely an operating requirement that can be trumped by the higher priorities of price. So for a long time, there's been a small but growing group of people who've been arguing for a different approach to managing our economies. One that moves beyond the philosophy of continuous growth to a more holistic approach. One that recognises the limits of our ecosystems and our connection to all the things that exist within those ecosystems. Early advocates include the Club of Rome, the book Beyond Growth, and probably the model that most engineers we encounter are familiar with, and that's the model of donut economics, that we have to exist between a minimum social uh, floor and an ecological ceiling. The declaration of climate emergencies in 2019 gave greater attention to these alternative voices. And what these approaches are alluding to is a different paradigm right at the top. In other words, a different book for the top of the bookshelf. The book of holism or holistic thinking. A paradigm that recognises that there are limits to what our ecosystems can support. And if we're going to thrive, we've got to learn to thrive within those limits. And it's in, within this paradigm, this overarching philosophy, that regenerative design sits. In our book, we define regenerative design as a systems goal that sits within this holistic paradigm. The goal of regenerative design is for human and living systems to survive, thrive, and co-evolve. I'll say that again, because it's really important. The goal of regenerative design is for human and living systems to survive, thrive, and co-evolve. Let's just draw out some of those words there. There is this idea of wholeness. It's not humans on our own, but humans and living systems together. And we want them to survive, but we don't want just to survive, we want to thrive. And we want those, the rest of the living world to thrive as well, for us to live well together. And critically, because we are in changing times, we need to be able to adapt. These represent a fundamentally different framing of what we're here to do as designers. Let's put them all back into the systems bookcase. And so now, rather than growth at the top, we see holism or holistic thinking. And then at that goals uh, shelf, rather than build stuff, make a profit, and do it safely, we have these much more regenerative goals of for human and living systems to survive, thrive, and co-evolve. This is a fundamentally different shift, a shift from an industry that we're currently in, which leads to two big questions. The first is, what goes on the shelves below? In other words, if those are the goals and that's the paradigm, what are the mindsets that support those goals? What are the operating rules which we need to deliver on those? And ultimately, what are the things look like that we're gonna go and design? And then the second question is, how do we shift from our current system to that new system, that system in which we play a role in creating a thriving world. Today, we're going to focus on the second question, that creating the shift from the existing system to the next one. So to help us think about creating a viable transition, we put three of these bookcases next to each other. 
and to create what we call the Library of Systems Change. And this builds on the thinking of influential futures thinker Bill Sharp and his Three Horizons model. The bookcase on the left represents, um, represents the present, the one on the right, the future that we want, the thriving future, and the one in the middle represents the transition. And we've introduced three colours to help us think about the, how the paradigms may shift over time. So let red be the colour of the existing paradigm, yellow the colour of the future holistic paradigm, and blue some sort of transition, which is a stepping stone between the two. Well, we might expect the majority of the books in the left-hand side in the current paradigm to be red, in alignment with that dominant paradigm. But we see that there are a few blue books. These are forward-thinking technologies, approaches, rules, strategies that are just about in alignment with the red, but could create a stepping stone to the future. They're just about tolerated, but they allow the future to exist as well. And then we see there are one or two yellow books, not many. These are the future things that already exist in the present. They're usually very small because the system doesn't want them. It doesn't accept them, but we can find them if we look for them. And what we see as we move from uh, left to right, gotta get my directions right on my screen, as we move from left to right is a gradual shift from red to blue to yellow as the current paradigm, which is no longer serving us, gives way to some sort of transition and hopefully towards something that can lead to thriving. Now, let's make this a little bit less abstract by thinking about what some of these books might be. And in particular, we wanna focus on the blue books, the things that are helping us create this transition. So let's think about, for example, net zero design guidance. This could be a blue book sitting on the operations shelf, a series of rules that help us decide, define how to design for net zero. So they exist in the present. You can get guides. The institution has published guides, but we see those as a stepping stone to the future. They exist in the present, but they're a stepping stone to the future. So that's an example of a blue book on the operations shelf. Now we could argue that it is a stepping stone to the future. We could equally say that it could be just a cover up for business as usual and is not actually making any difference at all, in which case it's not a blue book, it's a red book. And we have to be very careful about finding these technologies and deciding whether they're actually genuinely making chain, change or whether they're just a way to carry on doing what we're doing already. Another example of a blue book could be uh, biodiversity net gain requirements. So again, something that exists at the operating level to show that you're contributing to biodiversity net gain on the site. Now you could say that is a stepping stone to being much more considerate of what the living world is doing. Or you could say that it is really just taking a reductive approach to what the living world is, trying to divide it up into countable objects, in which case it might not be helping us at all. It might be a red book. So in looking at this bookcase, it's useful because it allows us to see how do all the things that we're doing create an opportunity to create a transition towards a more regenerative future. And it allows us to ask, what is the role of the regenerative designer? And in fact, we think that there are three roles for the regenerative designer. The first is as follows, to imagine the future and go look for it in the present. James and I are big fans of the work of Rob Hopkins, and he describes the climate crisis as a crisis of the imagination. And this is a, an idea that really resonates with a lot of the engineers we speak to. So we have to do that work. We have to keep imagining what this thriving future is like, because it's not around us. We have to go and imagine it. We have to do that work with other people, and we have to look for it in the present. So that's job number one, imagine the future and then go and find it. Job number two is to use whatever influence we have to create the transition, to grow those blue books on the shelf, to build out that guidance, to change mindsets, to aim higher in the system. And that's one of the key principles that we have in chapter four in the book when writing a regenerative design brief. James is gonna cover the others a little bit later, but one of them is aim higher in the system. Don't just think about your project, think about how you're creating systems change. Think about your, how you're putting something higher on the bookcase, which is making that transition. And then the third one, critically, is to actively manage out the present. We need to find the patterns of behavior that we have now that are destructive, and we need to systematically and visibly start reducing them. Now, none of this is easy. 
If it were, we would probably have done it. But I take hope from the fact that lots of people want to do this work. Over a thousand people have signed up to this lecture. If this lecture were in the Barbican Hall in London, it would fill up the stalls and the first balcony. That's a lot of people right now being interested in regenerative design. Over 400 companies have signed up to the Structural Engineers Declare statements, and they are committed to regenerative design. Our book is full of case studies that hopefully show people doing the H2 and the H3 stuff, and so that you can start to see how that library of systems change is being populated. We do our work as structural engineers to make things better. Regenerative design helps us define what better actually looks like in the context of the climate and biodiversity emergency. Our job is to keep imagining that future now, to start building the transition towards it, and to start managing out the present. At which point, I'm going to hand over to James. Amazing, Ollie. Thank you so much. That was outstanding. Uh, as Ollie said, um, it Ollie's given us some sort of background into what this is and how we need to think. Uh, I'd like to now show you one of those examples of the future in the present. Uh, and the example I'd like to give you is um, the example of ModCell. Um, ModCell is a modular straw bale construction system um, that's been around for over 20 years. Um, so the first uh, thing I wanted to point out, as Ollie alluded to, is we got these three aims uh, of living that the replicate living systems. Uh, and so the first aim is to build symbiosis. So to create um, systems which don't just take uh, and are extractive, but actually um, enable both us uh, and living systems to flourish. Uh, and so um, ModCell uses straw. Now, I don't know how much you know about straw, uh, but I know that it is abundant, uh, it's renewable, and it is a waste material. Um, and these words are, are I think, important in, in the context of regenerative thinking and regenerative design. Um, now, straw bale in construction has a number of properties. Um, it uh, has very good thermal properties. So this is a, a thermal image of a project. And you can see where the straw bale is because that's where the heat is not escaping out of the building. Uh, it sequesters carbon. Um, now, I appreciate that there is lots of debate about carbon sequestration, especially in the timber space. Um, but uh, these slides are, and these images are actually from a project which is now over 10 years old uh, and um, kind of goes way before, comes way before all of that debate. And, and, and I think importantly, really does pick up on the fact that in this case, we are building with carbon. We are taking carbon out of the atmosphere uh, and blocking it into um, buildings instead. So we are actually reducing uh, the carbon in the atmosphere by using this material, which would otherwise just be ploughed back into the ground. So it has very low embodied carbon. In fact, it may even lock carbon into the building and it has great insulating properties, which enable buildings to perform well, to be very low energy. And this is the story of one group's attempt to use this material in construction. Those people are Margaret Cook and Tim Mander, who are directors or were at the time directors of Integral Engineering Design. I say were because Tim has since retired. Uh, and Linda Farrow and Craig White, who at the time were uh, working for White Design um, and now uh, work for Agile Housing, I believe. Ooh, Craig um, will correct me, I'm sure. Um, and so... Here we go. This is this is the very first mod cell project. Uh, and the thing I'd like to highlight here is this is 2002. And the first mod cell project was not uh, a 15 story tower block made out of mod cell. It was, in fact, two straw bale panels at the end of a building. And you can see them because they are the blue squares. Uh, and one of the things about regenerative design is um, this idea of continuously improving and iterating. So you find something, an opportunity, uh, and, and we take that opportunity and we, we start to explore and see what happens. Um, we talked earlier about the all of us uh, thinking and wanting to go into engineering to make a better world, but actually at the moment we may be making things worse. And 
And actually, part of that making things worse is because we scale out up without thinking about the problems that that causes. And so in regenerative design, we start small, we observe what happens when we do something, and then we build bigger. So it started with just two M panels back in 2002, uh, over 20 years ago, long before people were talking about regenerative design, long before people were talking about embodied carbon in buildings. Um, this is a really amazing piece of future thinking and future work. And the product, uh, and it's not a project, it's a product, ModCell, um, has been utilized on a number of really uh, interesting and innovative and important projects. So this is the Nol West Media Center. I'm a huge fan of the Nol West Media Center because of the work that they do. Nol West is an area of uh, incredible deprivation. Uh, I don't know if you spotted it, but it was in the news just a few weeks ago because there was some murder there. Uh, and this is an area which really is that things are tough. Uh, and Nor West Media Center is at the heart of a transformation of that community um, through building buildings for people who uh, need housing, through working with the community, through raising people up. And, and, and that happens because there is this building, this community center, which is made out of regenerative materials. So the, the mod cell has been used on projects that have a positive societal impact. So you can see the symbiosis. It's, it's, it's absorbing carbon. We're building with carbon, but we're also um, having a positive societal impact. And the live, second uh, aim of Living Systems Blueprint is to reestablish interconnection. And let's explore that through this example. So back to mod cell. Uh, this is one of my favorite sets of slides because um, this is a factory where they make mod cell. And the reason I love this is because it's about a mile and a half from where I live and I regularly run past this location. Uh, and the reason that's important is because it's a flying factory which was set up for a specific project. It's about two miles from the location of the project and the straw was sourced as locally as possible. So what we have now is a factory which is operating kind of in, in the vicinity of the project using as much local material as possible, which means there is all of this incredible connection. Here you can see they're building the timber frame. So ModCell isn't just straw, it's made from timber um, as well. And the timber is not locally sourced, that would be imported. Um, and that's why it's a transition. It's not yet the full regenerative picture. We're still using some materials which will have a higher carbon footprint. Um, and But uh, by building it locally, we're able to connect to not just the materials, but also uh, we're able to connect to the community. So this is my favorite picture. Here is the flying factory in full swing. And here are some of the community who are going to be the um, receivers of the building. They're, they're, they're students who are going to be at the school where these mod cell panels are going to be installed. So the community is, is engaged in not just uh, as a consumer, but actually building their own building, which I think is amazing. We're creating this interconnection. We're getting the community involved. We're upskilling local tradespeople. We're utilizing resource from as near to the site as possible. We're, we're kind of changing the way that we work. The third uh, aim uh, of our living systems blueprint is to enhance capacity to self-organize. And so this project here is Lilac Leeds. And Lilac Leeds is, is a, a phenomenal project for a variety of reasons. I really love Lilac Leeds. Uh, it's worth going and reading about and, and, and digging into. Um, but one of the things I discovered about Lilac Leeds is um, that the one of the main clients on that project, so it's a co-housing project where um, the people who uh, live there also were the clients and they have completely different ways of funding the project and completely different ways of um, pricing their housing and all sorts of other ownership interesting things. Uh, and what I discovered is that one of these clients is a guy called Paul Chatterton. And Paul is a lecturer in uh, geography, radical geography at Leeds University. Uh, and not only uh, is he a client, he is also um, an author of books on how to transform and regenerate um, our cities. Um, so he's written this book called Unlocking Sustainable Cities. Uh, uh, and one of the things I love about that is, you know, ModCell is not the thing that 
brings everyone together, but it's part of this really rich tapestry uh, which interconnects many different regenerative practitioners. We've got lots of different people all working in a regenerative space and they're overlapping and intersecting. And, and so I read this book and was delighted to discover that the, the very project that I loved and that Modcell were involved in happens to be a project that he was involved in as a regenerative practitioner. And so we, we have this kind of really beautiful interweaving and intermeshing kind of um, system uh, and then, as Ollie alluded to, um, we should be aiming higher in the system. How do we move from the design shelf up to the operations shelf? How do we enable um, uh, a project to become utilized and learned from by others? How do we enable people to um, replicate this elsewhere? And so we've talked about the library of systems change, uh, and here we are moving from the present to the future, and we're in this transition space. And how do we move up? How do we aim higher in the system? Uh, and this is such a great example again, because ModCell wasn't just um, a building product. It was also a research project. It was undertaken by a number of um, people at Bath University in collaboration with my colleagues at Integral Engineering Design. And uh, as a research project, that information was shared. So you can go and read about it. You can learn about uh, the different properties that were discovered. You can learn about the, the, the different things that they, they developed. Um, so that information is shared. Not only is it shared, but um, you'll find that we have these incredible regenerative practitioners who, despite um, ModCell no longer uh, operating, uh, and as Ollie said right at the very beginning, it's very difficult to do this work in the current um, in the current paradigm, uh, and and that, that is a reality. Um, but actually, these regenerative practitioners have continued to work. So, sorry, I've just realised uh, I haven't explained what this is. This is the nucleus building at Hayesfield Girls School. Um, which you have seen in lots of different guises. You've seen it as a thermal image. You've seen the mod cell panels being built for this project uh, in the flying factory. But this is the final project. Uh, and I just love this project. It's based not far from where I live down in Bath. And I really think this is kind of um, the cutting edge of sustainability. And yet, I don't think this is the, the future. I think this is a transition and we need to continuously innovate and, and challenge ourselves to think about how we can move forward to create this regenerative future. This is kind of a stepping stone on our way to something else. And that isn't the end of the story. Uh, Agile Homes, which is uh, Linda Farrow and Craig White's new venture, carries on. That's uh, making houses still out of straw, different type of straw this time. These are compressed straw panels. So they're much thinner walled panels, but they're still using straw, this waste material. And they're now looking at how to use that material to enable uh, people from uh, deprived areas to move into their own housing. Uh, they're looking to solve the housing crisis for those who need housing the most, which is really, really exciting. Uh, and it shows how we've created an ongoing uh, regenerative culture that, that the people involved in ModSile didn't then just give up, uh, but they carried on innovating. They carried on doing new and exciting things. Um, and they're not the only people. So uh, Paul Jackwin, actually, who was one of the engineers who worked on ModCell and then moved out to New Zealand, he also has taken what he's learned. And he's now looking at how he can deliver a similar product in New Zealand to enable uh, in New Zealand for them to use straw in the same way. So at the very beginning, we posed a question. Can a structural engineer be regenerative? Is it possible? Um, can we imagine what that might even look like? And hopefully through this little snapshot uh, uh, of this case study, we have started to unpick what that could look like, how we might move forward. Um, but there's maybe a few things to reflect on. The first thing is that this was not a project in the way that we might think about projects. It, it actually required a very different mindset. It required uh, the people involved to think differently, that they, they didn't approach it as a one-off project, but actually as a, a much longer, bigger conversation. Uh, and so they, they, they became not just people who worked on one project, but practitioners who looked to develop uh, and explore 
uh, these ideas. The other thing is um, the answer is not for everyone to use straw bail. That 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 is not what I'm trying to suggest here. Instead, we should be looking at these underlying principles. How did they operate? How could we take those same ideas? How could we see what was abundant in our uh, locality and, and utilize that in construction? Maybe um, you live in an area where there is an abundant uh, source of existing buildings that you can utilize uh, and make use of in the, in the future. I, I often look out over the city of Bristol where I work and think there is so much wealth in terms of material wealth. How can we make better use of this material rather than building and fresh? How can we use what we already have? Maybe you live in a very different location. Maybe your uh, abundant source is very different, but I think we can start to ask these questions and feel excited about what is possible. So can a structural engineer be regenerative? Yes. I mean, I, I hopefully you can see that it is possible that we have shown you that it is. But not only can structural engineers be regenerative, but everyone who works in the built environment. And as Ollie alluded to right at the beginning, this this is not just about engineers. This is actually about everyone involved in the built environment, whether you're a, an architect or a quantity surveyor, whether you're working acoustics or health and safety. Um, everyone has a part to play, whether you're a mechanical or electrical engineer. I'm going to forget discipline and I'm going to upset someone. Uh, but, you know, everyone that is involved in this conversation, we all need to work together. We all need to be moving ourselves forward and creating this transition that, that needs to happen. And not only can we, but actually uh, we know that this has to happen, that, that we cannot carry on operating in the current paradigm. We cannot carry on operating as we are, because actually at the moment we don't have the ability to imagine a future where our buildings actually do no harm or, or even better do good, that, that we need to create this new uh, possibility. Uh, it is essential. So what now? Where, where, where do we go from here? The three things I'd like to suggest. Number one, please get informed. Um, this this subject is is new. It's developing. It's fast moving. There's lots of information out there. Um, so here are eight books that I personally have read and uh, in for different reasons would recommend all of them. Um, uh, I won't spend hours, but very, very quickly, um, I would start with thinking in systems so that you can have a systems framework. Uh, by and that's by Donella Meadows. Um, I then move um, through some of the other books here. So we've got a variety of different books around regenerative design and what that might look like uh, in the civil, structural and uh, architectural realm, essentially. Uh, we have a few slightly different books. We have Rob Hopkins from What Is to What If. Um, Ollie said that we're big fans, big fans. Um, and he, he talks about unleashing our imagination and I think that is so, so fundamental. I really personally love the work of Moa Al Spoonie, uh, and she has written a book uh, called The Battle for Home. She's actually written two books. I recommend both of them. And there's something in there about just understanding the world from a different perspective. So she's a Syrian architect and talks about her experience of being an architect in that context. And it's just so useful and rich to be able to understand different ways of seeing the world. Uh, and then if you really want to dive deep, um, Christian uh, Daniel Christian Wall's book, Designing Regenerative Cultures, really is full of depth. Um, it's not an easy read, which is why I wouldn't start there. But I think once you've started to understand the regenerative space, there is actually lots to be learned from, from his work and loads of great questions that it challenges us to ask. The next thing you can do once you have um, got informed is to get involved. Uh, and there's loads of different ways you can get involved. One very, very simple way is to participate, to become part of a community who inform the context content of the regenerative design primer. So this Friday, Architects Declare are, uh, are releasing their draft um, of their regenerative design primer. It's open for consultation and they are looking for case studies. Um, they are looking for projects to share or for stories, more longitudinal studies that, that we can share and, and, and explore and help us understand better what regenerative design looks like. And I, I would really love to challenge everyone on this call to think about who could they include or what could they include, which is not their work, but someone else's. 
a different practice, maybe uh, uh, something that's going on in a different culture. Maybe it's something that, um, you, you know, kind of your competitor is, is doing, because I think there's something really exciting about us working together collaboratively uh, and, and, and shouting about and celebrating each other's work, which is just really important in this space. Um, so that primer is, is, is already available uh, online, I believe. So the link is at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and it's also in the resources section. If you can't see it, as I understand it, if you quickly refresh, you'll then be able to see it. So, so get involved. There's loads of other ways to get involved. This is just one, but get involved. Do what you can. Join the conversation uh, and, and then start small like the guys on ModCell. You don't have to start with a massive project. Start small. Uh, and I put in brackets, don't build, start small and build. Build is such a metaphor in our, our world that, that um, we, we, we kind of think that um, build is always good. Uh, and maybe as we move into kind of more circular ways of doing things, maybe as we reuse what we already have, we don't have to build, but start small and, and build. Start um, somewhere, uh, have a go, learn, share, uh, challenge each other uh, and, and see what happens.